Hi, I'm the Warrior Witch and you can call me Nike. I'm doing a quick intro today because this video is going to be a slightly different format. So, just so y'all know, uh, this is going to be a little bit more podcasty because I'm featuring a guest today who is not going to be showing their face. So if you just want to have this on like you would listen to any other podcast, that's going to be best because uh, it's just going to be our two pictures up side by side with the audio playing over it. And you'll see my actively moving alive face at the end of the video to sign us off. As an intro, uh, we'll be talking about the intersection of science and witchcraft and where me and my guest think that they mix. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the video, audio, and I will see you guys at the end. All right, everybody, hello. So we're here in podcasty type land with Astra. So Astra, if you want to introduce yourself, talk about your path, et cetera, all the, the juicy details, this is your time to shine. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Nikki, so much for having me on. Um, it was such a surprise, a, a welcome surprise. Um, always happy to talk science <laughs> with another practitioner. Um, I am a grad student currently getting my PhD in biochemistry. Um, for those who are interested, I can go a little bit into my research. When it comes to developing drugs for um, therapeutic purposes, one of the things that we really struggle with is that small molecule drugs can really only target a very small subset of the proteins that are involved in disease. And so my research is finding ways essentially to take better drugs, things like peptides and antibodies, which you might be familiar with if you've been following COVID, um, and making them more cell permeable so that we can interact with the proteome that's actually inside of the cell, where a lot of these like um, protein-protein interactions that happen during disease, they're either disrupted or um, you have proteins that are overexpressed, and so they react more with each other. And so by um, delivering more biologics, so larger molecules, again, peptides, proteins, so on, we can interrupt these disease pathways much like better than we can with small molecules. That's the, the gist of it, I guess you could say. Um, so I really focus on making those things cell permeable and getting them in to disrupt these, these interactions for diseases. Um, when it comes to my practice, <laughs> when I'm not doing science in the laboratory, it's definitely varied from the beginning to the end, like where it is now. I started off as a folk practitioner. The first book I read was Wicca by Scott Cunningham. And I feel like that's a, that's a classic when people start. Um, and I didn't necessarily consider myself Wiccan at that point, um, but it definitely drew me into the, the folk practice side of things. I considered myself an eclectic folk witch for probably the first three years of my practice. Um, and then I was introduced uh, to planetary magic by one of our good friends, Kat, and um, really got into planetary magic pretty quickly, went really in depth, really fast, um, really connected with it. And I really, I think, I don't know, enjoyed both the scientific aspects of it, but also the spiritual aspects of it. Um, I really like the idea of, of as above, so below, which ironically, I actually found later when I began to study hermeticism. Um, that's kind of where I have landed. So I'm, a, I don't know, amalgamation of a couple of different practices, I guess you could say. Um, planetary magic and hermeticism are definitely my primary focus, like uh, focuses, but I still do kind of dabble in folk practice here and there because it is part of my roots and it will always be a part of my practice. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so we're just going to be talking generally about how we feel that science and witchcraft intersects, where we maybe won't think it is, we'll see, it'll just sort of flow naturally. So I'll just jump us into some talking points because I always reference it. I've referenced it a few times on my channel, I've referenced it on OWASP, so it'll be no surprise when I talk about it, but I think that I usually jump to things like herbalism for where I think that science and magic intersects because we know that certain things, uh, like certain plants were used as you know, drugs and medicine, herbal medicines becoming modern medicine and how those intersect and some of the uh, like magical uses also corresponding to their medical uses in certain senses. Um, so I would love to hear your thoughts on that because they've heard me talk about it before. <laughs> yeah, so it's actually, I really love the idea of um, holistic medicine as an approach to treatment. I think um, the scientific community often says that it's not good enough, which I think is kind of silly because in the past, like, um, in ancient societies, and really even even in cultures that aren't ancient, we see people using herbal remedies, and they are effective. 
um, maybe not necessarily in treating the particular disease itself, but at least in alleviating symptoms. And I think that is just as important as treating the disease itself. And in fact, many pharmaceutical drugs that we develop in the industry are actually based off of natural products. Essentially, what we do is we, a medicinal chemist will take them and they'll kind of look at the structure of a natural product and they'll alter it in ways that make it better than the original, whether it be in terms of like making it more specific and as to where it goes, um, making it more effective. Um, something you could do is like changing specific functional groups to increase the binding to a particular target. Um, and then like it'll be more efficacious downstream um, and, you know, among other things. And so a lot of medicines that we have now come from those original natural natural products. So when it comes to using them in your spell work, like you mentioned, a lot of them have medicinal properties that are applicable in magic as well. And I think that's where a lot of kind of the standard correspondences come from that we have. So things like, like sage, for instance, we use for cleansing, right? Well, sage has antimicrobial properties. Now, I don't know for sure if those are like released into the air when you burn it. You know, I don't know the the chemistry behind that but in specifically. Um, but that correspondence between the antimicrobial properties and the idea of cleansing makes sense. Like that correlation is, is a logical one to make uh, as to why we use it for certain things. And the same goes for, I'm sure, plenty of other herbs. I'm probably not quite as well versed in that as you are, Nike, but for sure, like there is absolutely reason to have that correspondence between herbs and their medicinal properties, even their, even if they don't have medicinal properties, like they will probably have certain characteristics um, that are attributed to their standard, to their standard correspondence. And as a practitioner, I think it's really important for us to look into that. Um, I know you talk about it a lot on your channel, um, both in OWASP and also on your personal channel, that when you use herbs and witchcraft, it's more than just about their magical correspondence. You should also be looking into them mundanely. And I agree. I think that's, that's, that's so important. I have, you know, Cunningham's book of magical herbs, like sitting on my shelf here, but I also have um, an almanac of just like herbs, like from a, from a garden store that's just down the street. Um, and I, I use both when it comes to deciding which herbs I want to use because both the mundane properties are important as well as the magical properties. Yeah, and uh, one of the ones that I'm, I'm not going to reference what I usually do, which is foxglove, so I'll go to a different one. Correct me if I'm wrong. My memory always gets a little foggy. I believe it's willow bark is something that you could, like, chew on. It has a lot of properties, like, healing-wise that are awesome, but I believe if it's you chew on the bark and it can help with, like, toothaches. Am I remembering that right? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think yeah. it's the bark of some kind. Willow bark sounds correct. Yeah, willow, willow bark is used for a lot of stuff. Um, but when you know, we're, I actually have uh, Cunningham's book pulled up right now in front of me because I have a, a digital version <laughs> of it. And yeah, in his book, and you know, obviously different people are going to say different things, but I'm just going with Cunningham because it's the one that most people have. Uh, Cunningham has it listed in part as used for protection and healing. So just a direct correlation. It's great to use in healing spells and in physical acts of healing. There, there's lots and lots of ways that it gets used. Um, you know, the things that it's connected with yeah. can often be connected with those things. So definitely it's a lot of stuff that, you know, you might hear uh, just, you know, standard sort of old wise tales or like home remedies, stuff that you can like, I think it's chickweed. If you get some sort of burn from, I think nettles, you can crush chickweed and rub on your hands. Don't take my word for that, but I think that's a like a, a natural remedy type of thing. But natural remedies are everywhere. Uh, and I, I think it's always fascinating to when you hear, you know, folklore or home remedies or whatever of, yeah, if you have this thing happen, then grab this plant and do whatever to then look into the magical properties, because often they will be related to that in some sense. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, I actually, so I just pulled this up on Google. Um, and Willow bark, it looks like, is actually like a natural um, form of aspirin. So if you chew on the bark, the active ingredient, which is salicin, can act as a, a natural form of aspirin, which would, which makes sense then, again, with its magical properties yeah. um, of protection and healing. Yeah, absolutely. So another example is, uh, you know, often in like teas and stuff. So chamomile being like calming for sleepy time stuff, uh, very just like gentle, soothing kind of herb. Um, and it is used for lots and lots of stuff, uh, but Cunningham lists it for calming and sleep incenses and brews, which makes sense. We literally have it as sleepy time tea, uh, and also money. 
I don't know the folklore behind the money stuff. Some of that might be more like cultural thing, but I know that I use chamomile and money spells. So, you know, it's just the direct correlation. You want like peace, you want calming, you want sleep. Uh, there you go. Chamomile, just drink it. We know that it has some calming effect by like actual science. So we can also connect it with, uh, with magic. Yep, absolutely. The other one, since you mentioned planetary magic before, I always love to reference to other people, astrology and astronomy. And uh, some people tend to forget or maybe just straight up aren't taught because we live in as much as America, because we're talking from American perspectives, as much as America is fairly Christian, we are also a fairly secular society. So we point to, to science, we point to traditional like Western medicine as we think of it, you know, pills and medicines like NyQuil and whatever. Um, but for a long time, science and what we would consider magic were super intertwined. Astrologers were also astronomers. They were measuring the sky. There's a lot of math involved, like the, the science, you know, a, a lot of a lot of things that we consider magical or folklore or whatever, it was part of what was considered sciences. And without astrology, we wouldn't have as much of a basis on astronomy. We didn't really have as much of a reason to look up in the sky if we didn't have our, what we would consider now, magical uh, ideas behind them. You know, why do we need to measure where the stars are? Why do we need to measure the, the seven wandering stars that move about the sky, meaning the planets? Uh, well, we did it for astrology, and then that led us to studying them more for astronomy purposes. So, you know, it, especially in that example, they're they're so intrinsically linked. And it's weird to think of it this way, but like math was developing uh, way, way back in the day. Uh, so, you know, it was developing right alongside with other sciences and other uh, scientific type areas like math all working together. It facilitated a lot of cultural exchange, um, you know, di different techniques that other people were using all mixing together. There's a lot of uh, cultural exchange and talk between astrologers from uh, India, or what we now consider India, and Greece. You know, there, there were a lot of more mundane things that went along with the quote unquote magical, such as in astrology. Yeah, um, it's, it's so interesting when people talk about math and, and chemistry and astronomy and it's now so separated from the origins i mean mathematics back when it was first um i guess you could say discovered or invented was a way to systematically study and explain the universe like it had mysticism behind it um and like the philosophy of of many different um like mystic traditions and i think so many people forget that and it's like all you have to do is go back and be a student of philosophy and you'll see it fairly quickly i mean even in the works of Pythagoras and Plato, we see it fairly commonly. And it's funny we mentioned um, in terms of like astrology and astronomy, the same thing happened with alchemy and chemistry. I've recently been studying alchemy pretty heavily because um, I wanted to view my practice or my like career in a more spiritual light. Um, and one of the ways that I've done that is by looking into alchemy. And a lot of a lot of alchemical processes, one of the things that they did was this idea of as above, so below was very prevalent in the alchemical field. And um, when they were doing any kind of alchemical work, they had like their laboratory consisted of an actual like lab space where they did the workings um, on like the physical realm. And then it also contained a place for them to do the spiritual workings, the the self, you know, self-study, self um, transformations and so on. And there's this idea that I um, came across in a book and it's, you know, and it's pretty like well-established in alchemy itself, this idea of distillation. So a distillation is when you take something and over rounds of evaporation and then condensation, letting it drip down to a separate flask, you purify something over time. And it's this cycle and we see it more than just in the chemical laboratory. I mean, you could consider distillation in terms of like the cycle of rain, right? It rains and then over time, like the water evaporates back up into the air, into the clouds, it condenses, it rains again. This cycle of distillation is reminiscent of a cycle of purification of the alchemists themselves. And a lot of the, the common like chemical techniques that we have today, distillation is something you'll find in any analytical chemistry undergraduate lab class that you take. Um, if you work in a chemical lab, like you will distill things consistently. I do it all the time. It's such a basic chemical principle, but the the spiritual meaning behind that is this idea of like self-transformation and self-purification until you reach the purest, most enlightened state that you can be. And when I put two and two together, 
it really put a new profound like meaning on the kind of the work that I do. You know, alchemy is not perfect. <laughs> like there are things that they did, tinctures that they made, um, solutions that they made that, you know, were meant to cure and actually harmed. And that's just a, that's just part of the times where they just didn't have the scientific understanding yet. But it's a very interesting kind of different perspective on life. And I think it's really unfortunate that we've taken chemistry and we've separated it from the original alchemical principles from which it was, which it was derived. Very like similarly to astrology. Yeah, well, that, that makes me think of, uh, you know, like you were saying, uh, things that they intended to help, but it actually harmed. I mean, we still do that. We have uh, medical trials where they test certain treatments, certain medicines, and they intend it to help, but they are testing it out. And sometimes it harms, you know, they want to know the side effects, they want to know how bad it is, whether or not it actually helps, or if it uh, accidentally aggravates whatever condition, you know, we're, we're still doing that. A lot of these principles that we think are so separated really aren't, we're still following those same traditions, you know, so to speak now with our, our like hardcore secular science. Yeah, we, it's, it's always so interesting when I talk to people who are outside of the scientific field, because I have a very, like, I wouldn't say a limited scope because I, I was once outside of the scientific field. So I understand the confusion, but I think like we as scientists need to do a much better job of educating people who aren't a part of our field as to like what it takes to go from, you know, like point A to point B in terms of making a particular drug and getting it approved. It's hard. <laughs> it requires a lot of testing. And just like in kind of the ancient times when we would test something to make sure it's safe, it was a lot of repetition. And so we see that same thing happening over and over and over in the scientific field. We'll test on cells first, and then we'll transfer that to animals, and we'll transfer that to humans. And the reason why we go so sequentially, and that's the other thing too, is when something doesn't work in a particular circumstance, and this applies magically as well, but sometimes it's not the, the theory, or it's not like your particular spell, it's just that the circumstance that it was done in isn't correct. Oftentimes you'll hear people talk about um, this idea of results in like cells not necessarily being applicable to clinical trials. And the reason why is because you have cells which are complex in and of themselves, yes, but it's only a singular cell that you're that you're looking at in that particular case. When you transfer something to a multicellular organism, you now have a bunch of other pathways in place to help that like larger organism survive. And so when it comes to treating it, there are going to be going to be other things that are I guess you could say interfering or that the drug has to like work through and work with to actually elicit an effect. And kind of similarly to magic here, you might have a spell that works really well in one particular circumstance, but as soon as you try to apply it to something else where maybe it doesn't fit as well, it's not necessarily the spell. Maybe it's just the circumstance that you're using it in isn't the best for that, like for your particular intent or your desire, um, whatever it might be. I something we <laughs> see a lot in the witchcraft community is this idea of jar spells. They became really popular pretty quickly. Um, I would say during quarantine, probably because of witch talk. And something that I don't think people think about is whether a jar spell is actually the right kind of spell to be doing for a particular working. It's just like, oh yeah, like we'll do a jar spell. <laughs> and it's like, well, a jar spell to me is something that's meant to keep it contained. Like you don't want it to get out. And so you put it in a jar and you seal it shut. Um, and then you either put it somewhere where you can't see it or you go and bury it outside. Please do so ethically, of course, without harming the ground. Um, and like that, like that's what you would use it for. But I see lots of people use things for, like use a jar for like a money spell. And to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense because the whole point of a money spell, like at least in my practice, is to get money flowing, right? So in that case, you would want to use something more open, like a bowl or maybe a coin pouch or, you know, whatever that might mean to you. But yeah, it's... Yeah, Very definitely. Um, and I believe, because I was just listening to the episode the other day, I believe it was you or your co-host were talking about uh, miasma. I don't remember who it was. Do you, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you guys were talking about miasma. And like, I always find it really fascinating because we tend to have this view of people from the past, you know, from 2000 years ago or whatever, you know, the, the concept of miasma being basically germ theory. I mean, they didn't have the technology to be able to know what germs were. We didn't know what germs were until really, really recently, like only a few decades ago, really. Yeah. So we, we tend to look back and think they were really stupid. But honestly, if you didn't know what was happening and you just knew that getting generally near somebody who was sick could make you sick, 
you you find some explanation for it, even if your explanation is spiritual. And you know, there there's lots of ways that it intersects anyway. But I I think they're incredibly like inte- more intelligent than we give them props for. Because if you didn't have an explanation for it, but you had to give some explanation to start testing, you know, you name it. So you name it miasma and you start seeing like, well, how does the miasma get to me? If I get within this many, you know, what we would now call feet, uh, if I touch them, if they touch me, you know, which, which particular parts of interaction, which things, which actions that I take make that thing attached to me. If you don't know, you just have to find an explanation, start rolling with it. I mean, that's that's sort of the whole premise of science, right? Is to to find an idea and start testing it. Um, so I, I think we should make sure also when we're looking at some of this stuff, not to think that ancient peoples were stupid, because honestly, think of if you had nothing, you were out in the woods, you're a little baby, nobody ever tells you anything, you don't learn about science. How do you explain things that happen to you? You start testing things and figure out what works. But you know, if you're coming up with miasma you know the universe is ick getting on you that's the best you can do to explain germs i think that's way smart yeah am i allowed to talk about COVID on this podcast because i think yes okay so yes and it's actually really interesting because i think COVID is a perfect example of this right something new that we didn't have a lot of information on when it first came out now obviously there were there were strains of this like um sars and MERS, which came before that were very similar. They were both coronavirus strains. But like COVID-19 um, itself was different. And scientists, when we first began studying it, kind of went in blind. Um, a lot of the the older papers that were published at the very, very beginning are now looked upon. And the data, while it isn't necessarily negated completely, it's not looked upon as accurately as the data being published now, because now we have more information. We understand more about the virus and how it works. Um, but like, Those initial hypotheses are very similar to how people in the ancient worlds, like not even ancient, really, not wasn't that long ago, um, developed theories about how things were happening. Everything starts as a hypothesis. And having a hypothesis, even if it turns out to be wrong, or at least not supported by any data that you gather, that doesn't mean it was a bad hypothesis. It just means that it wasn't supported. And that's okay. And that happens all of the time in science. We develop a hypothesis of how something we think something works or something that should happen based on another interaction. And we do all of these tests and it turns out to be wrong. Is that a bad thing? No, it just means that that's not the answer. And so then you just go back and you regenerate your hypothesis. It's why science is falls under this, this use of the scientific method. It's a method and it's a circular method. It's not linear from A to B. It's, it's very much cyclic. It's, Um, you know, from A to point C, you get data that suggests your hypothesis might be wrong. You go back, you reformulate, and then you start again. Um, And that's when the people, you know, back in history were developing hypotheses as to how things were happening. It's understandable that many of those hypotheses would be wrong. And like you said, I don't think it gives us a good reason to like shit upon them for it (laughs) because they were doing with what they had at the time. And a lot of that was like spiritually based. And that's a legitimate way to look at something if that's based on your perspective at the time. Like before the the scientific revolution, you know, a lot of things are much more heavy on the spiritual side of things. And I don't think we can necessarily fault people for coming up with the spiritual reasons to why something might be happening when that was kind of the environment that they were in at the time. Right. Well, and we apply this to, to spell work too, or at least I do. I know a lot of people encourage like, if you are doing a new spell and you write your own, it's great to test it a couple of times. And a lot of people will say, like, I've, perfect- I've perfected this spell over the course of years. Uh, that's because they're basically doing the scientific method. You know, they're, they're picking a couple of things that they think will work. They're testing it over and over again. They're changing things as needed. So if they think it's this ingredient that made it go a little bit sideways, they switch it out for something else or just take it out entirely, test it that way. I mean, it, some spells take a long time to perfect because they're basically doing that. They're going back over and over again to see which parts work, which parts don't. How can I apply it? How can I make it better? We, we really do apply it. And there, there tends to be, you know, what, what all this is kind of leading into is there tends to be this idea in spiritual communities because, you know, we, we're sort of used to the, the idea from secular communities that everything must be secular. There is no spiritual. It's all science. But the opposite end, I think a lot of people try to make everything purely spiritual there's no science science like i straight up had people tell me that science has no place in spirituality and i i think they're absolutely wrong uh, i think that they are meant 
to mix. I, I think, you know, as above, so below, everything works together in a specific way. And, you know, however you want to phrase it, if you want to say like the vibrations out into whatever, you know, whatever way you want to put it. I think that science and spirituality absolutely mix together. And there's lots of ways that we can see it. I, I think it's kind of silly, uh, to put it lightly, to, to sort of try to reject one. Because, you know, I especially as we mentioned COVID, I've gotten a lot of hate online. And if I get any hate on this video for it, I will just be deleting it. Uh, I got a lot of hate online by spiritual people when I said that you should wear a mask. People saying that I was a psyop, that I'm mm. stupid, that I won't descend if I get the vaccine, that COVID is made up and it's unspiritual that. and unascended. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a whole time. <laughs> it was great. Uh, and people try to reject it so wholeheartedly. And it's like, number one, if you're a healer, you claim to be a spiritual healer, why would you be rooting for people to continue to get sick? Why why would you not empathize with, ugh, I don't even know what the count is anymore, all of these millions of global deaths? You can't you can't take two seconds to empathize, but you call yourself a healer and a light worker. Okay. I, I think that they're meant to mix and to reject one side or the other, personally. Like, I, I don't disrespect atheists. I think I used to be atheist for a long time. People may not know that. Uh, but I, I think that harsh rejection of both is bad in both directions. I think, as with anything, you, you need a good sense of balance. Yeah, science denialism in the spiritual community um, runs rampant. And I think it's really sad um, that we feel the need to separate the two so substantially. What I think is funny is that there are lots of people, and it's, I feel like I hear this more from New Agers than anybody else, although I certainly hear it in other other realms as well, um, this idea that science has no place in spirituality. But then they talk about things like energy, and right, like like Reiki is healing through through energy, essentially. And when, when people talk about, about energy in this way, then I just have to ask them, what, where do you think the energy comes from? I mean, the, the laws of thermodynamics, Newton's laws of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Literally the first law of thermodynamics, uh, you cannot destroy or create energy, which means that the energy you're using is coming from the system, the physical system of the earth and of the universe. And so when, it's when some people say that science and spirituality can't mix and they talk about using energy. I'm just sitting here like, but <laughs> you're using energy that has a scientific basis. And we, we know energy exists. Now, to be fair, um, some people would say spiritual energy is from, from physical energy. And I agree with that to an extent. But we know that energy has an influence on on magic. I mean, I don't I don't think anybody who works with magic would actually like would deny that. Um, and so I always find it funny when people try to separate the two because they aren't separate in any way. Um, I will say that one of the things that I struggle with sometimes is how people try to make science fit the spirituality. I think science has a lot to offer in terms of insight to spirituality um, but I don't think it can explain everything. And that's also okay. Um, I know like in my personal practice, combining science and spirituality has been a large part of that um, over the years. And I do try to try to see where the science might fit into spirituality, but I don't try to force it because there are some things that simply do not fit. Um, a lot of people like to reference the double slit experiment when they talk about um, intention and manifestation. And while I do certainly think that that is um, a theory that could, well, I should say a hypothesis, um, as to how something works. Like I, I do think that the double slit experiment provides kind of a good foundation for a hypothesis that, hypothesis that I have about how magic works in terms of intention setting and getting a manifestation. Um, but again, it's just a hypothesis and that's a quantum theory and quantum physics in and of itself is something that we don't really understand. We talk about it a lot, but we don't really understand it. Even I don't understand it um, perfectly. By no means am I a quantum physicist. Um, and so I think we have to be really, really careful about applying the science to spirituality. By all means, try. Try to apply it and see if you see if it fits and see if maybe an understanding of something scientifically gives you the foundation on which you can build a hypothesis for how something works spiritually. But you have to make sure that you aren't trying to force something scientific onto a spiritual um, topic where it doesn't actually fit. Um, 
and I do agree also uh, when it comes to like science denialism within the community, denying science doesn't make you more spiritual. <laughs> and I think if you are denying science, you're just putting more people in danger, including yourself. And I'm not sure why you would do that, you know, ethically speaking, because you're essentially harming not only yourself, but the community by spreading misinformation. And that does nothing for anybody. So, so stop it. <laughs> Oh, I so agree. So agree. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's no surprise that we agree. I feel like we'd agree on most of this. Um, and I, I love that point about not trying to shove science into the spiritual, just like the opposite way, not trying to shove, uh, you know, all of it apart. I, I do think that, you know, like you said, if you can have science help to explain some of it, go right ahead. Like we were talking about the herbalism stuff, you know, willow bark, we had it as a, a natural herbal remedy. We didn't really know why. And then science tested it and was, you know, hey, wow, look at that, a natural aspirin, natural painkiller. But there's also other things that I, I kind of view it the way I view reincarnation, which sounds silly, but like, hear me out. Uh, I think there's certain things we're not meant to know, or we're not meant to like scientifically explain, or at least not yet. You know, some of it we just might not have the technology for, whatever. But, you know, like with reincarnation, my, my view is, uh, you know, if we have past lives, future lives, whatever, I don't think we're meant to know what our past lives were. I don't think we're meant to know a scientific explanation for everything. Some things are just weird. And I'm okay not having an explanation for it in science. I, I think it's perfectly fine to leave certain things spiritual as long as you are having that healthy balance. Any, you know, any stray too far in either direction is always going to be harmful in some way, uh, I feel. But, you know, we don't have to have an explanation. We, we like to have answers, but we don't have to have them. They're, they're not always necessary. Yeah. And it's, you know, when it comes to things with the brain and like neuro, uh, neurochemistry and neurophysiology... There's so much we don't understand about the brain and how it works. And I think a lot of spiritual experiences are based on our, our neuropsychology. And because we don't know how it works, we don't have all the answers with many of these questions, many spiritual experiences. Um, scientists are still speculating about the idea of like multi, you know, level dimensions in our brains and whether those are actually, you know, a thing. Do they exist? Do we have different levels of consciousness that we can we can, you know, travel between, um, whether subconsciously or even consciously. And these questions are still being answered. And there are a lot of skeptics um, when it comes to these kind of experiences, myself included. But we know so little about the brain that to kind of just push those experiences to the side, like many scientists do, and just say that there's no way that they're legitimate, there's no way those thing, kind of things can happen, I think is really ignorant because that's making the assumption that we already know everything there is to know about the mechanisms that might have a role to play in these kind of things, when in reality, we certainly don't. I mean, my goodness, we barely know how pain receptors work in the brain and how pain is translated from your neurons into the brain and the pathways that it goes along with. I mean, even in that regard, we, we don't understand the brain fully and how it works. And so I don't think you can just disregard it because you don't understand. But that leads to another point, right? It doesn't need to have a scientific basis to be valid or to, to make your experience meaningful to you. That can still happen even if you don't have an explanation. I agree with you that there are things we might never understand scientifically um, that happen to somebody spiritually or, or are kind of a common spiritual um, experience that people have. And that's, that's okay. <laughs> it doesn't need to be explained. Um, would I certainly like it to be explained? Oh, yeah. Um, I would love to be able to explain everything scientifically, just because that would make everything so much easier to understand. But I think realistically, we're never going to reach that point. Um, partially because I don't think some of these things are actually measurable by scientific standards. Um, but we'll see, you know, maybe in the future, we'll come up with like some crazy way to measure. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, I think that's a, a great point to lead us into the end here. So Astra, if they want to find uh, you, any of your social media, social media, I'm leaving that in social media, <laughs> or if they want to find your podcast, where can they find you? What names can they look up, et cetera? What platforms are you and your podcast on? Tell us everything. Yeah. So um, we recently released a podcast, myself and my co-host, Hanny and Fell, um, called Test Tubes and Cauldrons. You can find us on both Apple Podcasts and also on Spotify. Um, hopefully we'll be getting things up on YouTube as well soon, um, but it's not quite there yet. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram under Astrological. Um, logical is actually spelled L-O-G-I-C-I-A-L. 
um, because logical like spelled the regular way was taken. <laughs> Just a heads up. Um, but you can find me on both Twitter and Instagram. If you have questions, you know, feel free to DM me. If you want to talk about science, happy to talk about science with you. But yeah, we just released our second episode. Um, next, our next episode, we're going to be talking about the placebo effect in magic. Um, and looking into something scientifically, which will be super interesting as well. But yep, Apple Podcasts and Spotify, Test Tubes and Cauldrons, if you want to give it a listen. I love that. And of course, everything will be linked below because it's always easiest if you don't know how to spell things correctly or if you forget them or whatever. It's way easier just to go to the description. So I will have that posted for everybody. Uh, and Astra, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was fun. Yay. All right. Well, I'll bring us to the video stuff. So see you guys in just a second with my wonderful face. And that's all we've got for you guys this week. I hope you enjoyed it. I absolutely adore Astra. I think she is wicked smart and I really hope her podcast goes places because I think it's an awesome concept. So uh, if you guys want to support her, I'll have her links places. I'll have her podcast linked in the description, you know, the whole nine yards. Uh, and if you want to support me, I've got all my social medias linked and I have a Twitter and Instagram. Obviously I have this. So if you're not already subscribed, you should definitely do so. Thumbs up on the video because it does help me in the algorithm. You know how we do. Uh, I've got a Patreon where you always get episodes early. Episodes? Videos. Whatever. You get content early. Uh, for the higher tiers, you get a little bit of extra bonus content here and there. Uh, and otherwise, that's uh, all I've got. So I'll see you guys next time and blessed be.